Stand to your feet this morning. I know you just woke up. You may not have come this morning to stand on your feet and give God praise, but we're going to do it today, all right? The song says that there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And we're just asking God to abide in us as we abide in him. church. May we bow our heads in prayer. Again, Heavenly Father, I give you the utmost respect for graciously giving me the opportunity to pray. Again, Lord, I ask this morning that you give me the words, Lord, that will touch and heal the people, Lord. Again, God, you showed me a vision. And the vision was a this guy that was pouring gas in his vehicle 
But again, he had a cigarette in his mouth, and I, I said to myself, I, that, that got to be crazy, or it got to be ludicrous. But again, we say things, and we look at things, but then you show me me. What I was supposed to do, amen? Again, God, you show me that sometimes we live our lives crazy, and we live ludicrous our uh, lives because we always wearing some type of mask. Mm -hmm. But again, Lord, you want us to reveal the trueness of ourselves, Lord. You want us to replace that mask for what, what you are instoring in us, Lord, and giving us, Lord, to give to the people. Again, Lord, I say thank you, Lord, because again, in the word, Lord, in Romans 3.28, it says that we all fall short to the glory of God, Lord. And again, Lord, we cannot point fingers at one another, Lord. But again, we have to bring them up, Lord. Again, I, I just thank you, Lord, for all that you have done, Lord. And again, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Again, we have to remove that mask, Lord. Be real, Lord. Give you the praise, Lord. Even when we don't have, Lord, we need to give you the praise, Lord. Again, when we don't have the money, the finances, Lord, we still need to give you the praise, Lord. In the bad time and the good, Lord, we still need to give you the praise, Lord. Again, Lord, we, we, we want to thank you right now, Lord, because we are here throughout the pandemic, throughout our worries, throughout the troubles we have on our job, throughout the problems we have in our homes. Lord, we are still here. So again, Lord, I want each one of you all to look at each other and reflect, Lord, and say thank you, Lord, because we are here. Again, Lord, the vision that I'm seeing right now, Lord, is that one day we will go back to our roots, Lord. We will go back to where church used to be, Lord, when there was no electricity, when there was no vehicles, Lord. We still was able to make it to church, Lord. We still was able to give you the praise, Lord. We might have not had all the food that we wanted, but we still gave you the praise. So again, Lord, we have to go back there. We have to go back, Lord. And that's what you showed me. You showed me that now the church is being something else other than what it used to be. Lord, again, I thank you, Lord, for giving me that vision. And I hope that this will touch somebody and remind them that regardless of your situation oh hallelujah regardless of what you are what you are going through on your job regardless of what you are going through in your marriage regardless of how your children are acting Lord we still want to give you the praise because you are worthy you are worthy you are worthy so again Lord I want to say thank you oh God thank you for the opportunity Lord I thank you and I ask that you Humbly, humbly accept this prayer, Lord, and bless everyone, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 12. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we punished him by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Amen. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession with the transgressors. This is the word of God. Amen. Good morning, Campbell family. Good morning. Our New Testament reading today will be from Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself was subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes his honor on himself, but receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Amen. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, the word of God. Amen. We acknowledge the presence of God that's in this place, but also wherever you may be worshiping today. We acknowledge our wonderful bishop, Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green Sr., and our wonderful supervisor, Supervisor Phyllis N. Green. We acknowledge the greatest presiding elder team in all African Methodism, presiding elder Philip C. Anderson and his queenly wife, Sister Sandra A. Anderson. To the best thing God ever gave me after Jesus, Sister Donna Black. Oh, show her a little love today. And she's ministering to my mother. They're together today. Two of the special ladies in my life, the Reverend Dr. Eliza Edie Black. She's with us in spirit. She, she was going to be with us physically, but she, instead she's with us in spirit and she's with us via Zoom. To our ministry team, that powerful group of willing workers, to our board of stewards, our board of trustees, our class leader council, to our wonderful musicians, our music ministry, our students, ushers, ministry chairs, AV team, other officers, visitors, members, and friends. We greet you in the joy and the love of the Lord. 
We're going to read just a few scriptures for you today from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 20, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Amen. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we need a word. A word that can change our lives for the rest of our lives. Hide John Black behind the cross. No one needs to hear from him. But speak a word to him and speak a word through him so that someone will be edified. Speak a word to him and speak a word through him so that someone will be saved. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the middle of a sermon series entitled The Call. And today's sermon is entitled called to be fishers of people Amen. called to be fishers of people now if you like king james we can say called to be fishers of men Amen. the generic men which means men and women Amen. we've had three sermons in this series the call first we explored the call of isaiah and his famous words here am i send me and then we explored Jonah, who, like so many of us, ran from his calling. But eventually, God used him. Yeah. Last week, we discovered the call of Samuel. And we discovered that God calls children, too. Many, many times, there are things youth can do that adults just cannot do. Amen. Today, we're looking at a New Testament call. Jesus is walking on a beach by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They are actively making a living doing what they do. They're fishing. Jesus asked them to follow him, and he would make them fishers of people. Here's the amazing thing. At once, they leave their nets, they leave their lives, they leave their occupations, they leave their families, they leave everything behind, and they follow Jesus. As a child, this story baffled me. How could someone respond to a stranger like that? Stranger walks up and says, come follow me, and you leave everything you have, and you follow him? The problem was my assumption. I assumed that Jesus was a stranger. And I didn't know the rest of the story. So our first sermonic point, and we'll explain the rest of the story. Sermonic point number one. New Testament evangelism is relational. New Testament evangelism is relational. In John chapter 1, we see John the baptizer has a mega church. He is uh, very much like my big brother Randolph. They draw the common people in. And John the Baptist was drawing the common people in. Peter was one of the members of John the Baptist's church. And Peter attended a service. And in that service, John says, listen, there's a revival coming. And when this revival comes, there's going to be one like the Messiah that's going to come. Now, now, people thought John might be the Messiah. And he was quick to say, I'm not the Messiah, nor am I Elijah. But there's one who's coming, and he's greater than me. And I'm not worthy to even untie his shoes. And Peter is sitting in that service and he's hearing all about this. This wonderful Messiah that's going to come. 
And then John says, listen, I didn't even know who it would be. But God told me that whoever I saw the spirit descend upon like a dove, that's the Messiah. Now, let me tell you a little back secret. John knew Jesus. That was his cousin. He just didn't know who Jesus was. The Messiah, God in the flesh. So when John baptizes Jesus, the land, I'm sorry, the dove descends upon him. And the next day, John sees Jesus. And he's standing with Andrew. And he's standing with Philip. I mean, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, with Philip. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is the backstory. You see, John had a powerful church, but here was coming someone else. And John said, he's greater than I am. This is the Messiah. This is like someone telling you, you can buy Apple stock on the first day that it got on the market. You know, he's saying the big deal is coming. And they see Jesus. And John points them at him. And said, y'all can talk to him. The brother's all right. I'm not upset. His ministry must increase. And my ministry must decrease. Now y'all know that was a miracle because not too many preachers said, go join that church. My, my church is okay, but y'all go join the church down the street because that's the better church. I don't, I don't hear any preacher saying that. But John said, it's okay to go. It's okay to go. And so we find out that even Jesus visited in Peter's and Andrew's town. And he also talked to, Nathan, uh, to Philip. And Philip would go and talk to Nathaniel, his brother. And he would say, we found the Messiah. And when Nathaniel greets Jesus, Jesus prophesied with the brother. And he said, here comes a man with no guile. And he says, you know, uh, Nathaniel said, how did you know that? He said, because I saw you before you even got here. I saw you in the spirit. All this happened. Before our text. And so we see this drawing in of Nathaniel, but we don't see a drawing in of Andrew and Peter. Jesus pulls in Nathaniel, but he doesn't pull in Andrew and Peter. And so Andrew and Peter are minding their own business and they're fishing and here comes Jesus and he offers them a deal that they cannot refuse. He says, hey, you all can come too. They've been waiting on this all their lives. A call like this. It wasn't just out of the blue. They were so elated when Jesus said, come on, I'll make you a fisher of people. You see how relationships work? God takes our relationships and make them into evangelical moments. Now, there's nothing wrong with going out into the hedges and highways and byways. But in the New Testament, we see that evangelism begins right where you are. When Jesus is sending forth the disciples, he said, where are you? They said, we're in Jerusalem. They start in Jerusalem. Then you go to Judea. Then you go to Samaria. Then you go to the uttermost parts of the world. Evangelism starts at your kitchen table. Evangelism starts in your home. It starts right there with the people you know and love. It is relational. You know, we want to pack the church and we leave five people home in our house. How are you going to pack the church and you left five folks home in your house? You know, if, the, if you're doing evangelism, it should start right there. Yes, yes. AME churches often realize that. And we put a focus on keeping families in the faith. You know, transmitting the faith from one generation to the next generation. I don't know where people got this idea that you just let kids grow up and when they get old enough, they'll decide where they want to go. Kids aren't smart enough to do that. We have to aim them toward their destiny. The Bible says they're like arrows in a strong man's quiver. And he aims them. Now, I'm going to tell you something. 
When you let the arrow go, you let the arrow go. And you can't control where the arrow is going to end up. But you should have aimed that arrow toward its destiny. If the wind moves it to the left or the right, you have no control over that. But when you aim it, you've done your job. It's amazing how many parents fail to aim the arrows and they wonder why they don't go anywhere. Evangelism starts in your home. Yes. Amen. Simonic point number two. New Testament evangelism points toward community. We got this notion, I guess because we're Americans, about all this individuality. We want to be saved as an individual. And, and, I, and me and God, we're a majority. And I don't need anybody but the Lord. I got the Lord, I'm all right. And that's not at all consistent with New Testament theology. God calls us to a family. God calls us to a body. God calls us to a community. And we're not just bringing people to Jesus. We're adding people to the body of Christ on earth. We're adding people to Abraham's family. This group that's coming together... They're coming together to form a new body, the church. And, and uh, Jesus is going to start with 12. Then he's going to move to 70. Then he's going to, the day of Pentecost, move to 3,000. And before long, in the book of Acts, you're going to find there's a number in this body that's so numerous that they could turn the world upside down. God places all of us into this body because that is his objective. He wants us to be his body here on earth. He wants our hands to be his hands. He wants our arms to be his arms. He wants our mouths to be his mouth. He wants our hearts to be his heart. He wants our love to be his love. So he can love humanity right here on earth. It's good to have a father who art in heaven. But it's also good to have a father who's right here on earth. I love it when the Holy Spirit grabs me in the spiritual realm. But sometimes I just need a Holy Spirit incarnated in the flesh to grab me in the human realm. Sometimes you just need somebody who can touch you physically and God intended for us to be that person. You know when we go to funerals, the Holy Spirit is there. But it's nothing that can compare to the Holy Spirit inside a believer holding on to a, a bereaved family member. You know how it felt when that loved one grabbed you? That was the God inside of them reaching out to you. And so we need to understand that God has put us together in this body so that we will cooperate and have unity with each other so we can be his body on earth. When Jesus was praying just before the crucifixion, when we studied this in the Bible study this week, he prayed that we, the church, the members of the church would be one just as he is one with the Father. And then he said they'll know that they're my children by their unity. Amen? Amen. Yes. Thank you. Yes. point number three. New Testament evangelism requires all believers to be fishers of people. Did you notice that everybody in our text and everybody in the back stories all went out and evangelized? We, we like to give evangelism over to those who have a title. The Reverend so-and-so or the evangelist so-and-so. But everybody that's called by the name of Jesus Christ has been called to evangelize. When, when uh, you see the Great Commission, it was not written just to those who are of the ordained clergy. 
But he said he sent all of us into all the world. Every one of us to preach the gospel. And to make disciples. That's the call that's upon every believer. No matter what your age. No matter where you've been. No matter where you're going. No matter how much education you have. God called you to be a witness. Apostle Paul called us epistles. Walking epistles read by all people. Don't you know the only Jesus some people are going to see is the person you look in the mirror every day? The only love they're going to feel from God is the love you show every day. God called us to be fishers of men. The, 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 the old church understood that. And the old church would get excited and then start singing. You know, we sing about our breakthrough and we sing about God blowing us up and we sing about the favor in our lives. And nothing wrong with singing about that. But they used to sing about bringing in the sheaves. Sowing seeds, sowing in the morning. Sowing seeds of kindness. Sowing in the noontime and the dewy eve. Waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. That's what they would sing about. When God uses us as evangelists, we will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. You see, it isn't about putting more numbers in the church. It isn't about having a bigger role. It isn't about doing more than the church down the street. Bringing in the sheaves is the fact that there are people in this world who are hurting. There are some folks who need to know the Lord. Life has beat them up. Life has tried it upon them. And they need to know that there's a God who can make a way out of no way. They need to know that there's a God who can open doors that no one else can open. They need to know that no matter what they've done and no matter who they hurt, there's a God who will love them and forgive them. He'll pick them up. He'll turn them around and he'll plant their feet on solid ground. They need to know that there's a God that loved them so much. He gave up his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They need to know the good news of the gospel that he'll reach way down, move death hell and the grave out of the way to find his one lost lamb. So that's why we're an evangelist, not to make our numbers larger, but to rescue those who are perishing. Oh, if you believe it today, give the Lord a praise. If you believe it today, so I can say hallelujah. Do you accept your call today? God called you to be fishers of people. Let us all stand. Yes, sir. The Lord's been getting on me because I've been doing a sinner's prayer. But as I was preparing for this service, it became quite clear. We're not supposed to be just bringing people to the Lord. We're supposed to be doing evangelism and discipleship. And this is the moment of discipleship. To get, to lead someone to Christ and not get them in a church where they can be fed the word, where they can have a prayer partner, where someone will suffer with them and walk with them. That's like catching a fish and dropping it on the bank. You didn't do any good. You got to get the fish home, right? Oh, yeah. And the way we get them home is we disciple them. So I'm going to open the doors for Christian discipleship. It doesn't matter where you are in the process. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you know him, but you don't have a church home. Maybe you know him, you're a member of Campbell Chapel, but you're not walking like you used to walk. 
it doesn't matter where you fall in that process, we extend the invitation to you and to you and to you. We ask the choir to sing as we extend the call to discipleship. Shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord.